Okay, we're pretty snazzy this year. We um, we have a podium. Check it out. Our own podium. I mean, it takes seven years in the making, but you know we've done it. Uh, and you, many of you, as you can be sitting in the middle rows, will have noticed that we've upgraded from economy to first class or business class with our seating. Check it out, right? Those are comfortable seats. I don't know if the school is in financial trouble, but they didn't skimp on the CD for Trius, so they must know something about us. You know? yeah. So thank you all for being here. You're a big crowd tonight. This is great. Um, so let me begin with, with thanks. This is the first reading of the year, and the first reading of the year is the Trius Writers. John McDonough. Uh, but I want to thank, as we always do, Peter Trius, our patron saint. Um, he was a student here and went off to Iowa and published a book of poems and made a lot of money in real estate and left us money to do nothing but bring a visiting writer every year. Um, so we are eternally grateful uh, to Peter Trius for that. I want to thank Mel Melody Hamilton and Kathleen Coles for being kind of the co-chairs of this thing over the years and how good this has all been. It's totally great. Uh, the Provost Office, uh, who we thank, and of course, um, Sue Gage, who is uh, back there, man in the camera, who makes everything work. Uh, and uh, you, can't, you can't put a price on that. Also, the Brian Cockett, who does the books, and John's books are here. Uh, if you want to buy any after the reading, then they're for you to do. Um, and I also want to thank John for being the the uh, visiting writer uh, for this year, our seventh, uh, and our first Trius writer uh, in creative nonfiction, um, or our first writer whose who's writing uh, time is primarily in the essay, though it is one of John's givens that genres are fluid, um, and that they are, perhaps we might say, fluids, not solids, and because they're fluids, they flow into each other and mix with one another. So before I give John a proper introduction, let me remind you that he's curating our reading series this year, and I want to just say who our two fall readers uh, are, who John will be introducing. Uh, in October, we have uh, the great and out of category writer, uh, Talia Field, whose work, most recently, Experimental Animals, is a book partly about the creation of the modern experimental method and how it was inseparable from vivisection, um, which is, most of you probably know, uh, the live dissection of animals. Uh, uh, the book, Experimental Animals, is so fluid and transgenre that reading is like going down a long, steep water slide, uh, which is both a thrilling thing and something which, when you do, you inevitably get wet. Um, in November, uh, we're bringing the memoirist, uh, Melissa Thibos will be here. Uh, her first book's a memoir, and it's about her years in graduate school making her living as a dominatrix. The book's called Whip Smart, uh, and it's a, it's a terrifically interesting book. Not because of the subject, though that of course is interesting, but because she's really a terrific <coughs> writer. Her new book, called Abandon Me, is a series of essays on love. And both are remarkable, both books, for their intensities. So that's October and November, and we'll let you know what's happening in the spring. Also, let me say, one, one last thing, it's not exactly in the Trius series, but it's part of our writer's reading series. Uh, a former colleague, a poet uh, in our department, in the English department, uh, Lauren Elaine, will be visiting. And on November 1st, she's going to give a reading under the auspices of writer's reading, uh, probably in the black world. Anyway, there'll be announcements about, about all these events. Okay, uh, it's our practice here to give spirited introductions at our readings. And by spirited, I mean in the spirit of the writer we're introducing. After all, novels, poems, stories, essays, all pass something of themselves along. They're contagious. And we're designed, as people, to be infected by them. Though we tend to say, a thing. We try to pass along in our introductions that infection, and often we do that by trying, by trying to capture the spirit of them, 
And because we introducers are also writers, we're prone not just to characterize or describe, or, or, or to characterize or describe, but to infect by mirroring and sort of taking on some characteristic of the writer in herself. So, John Degada graduated from here in 1995. Uh, started his first book of essays, Halls of Fame, during his honors project as a senior, a book which took eight further years, I think eight, we counted, that could be off by a little bit, uh, to finish, and then eight further years to write his second book about a mountain, which is a book about Yucca Mountain in Nevada, our nation's designated nuclear storage facility, but it's also a book about Las Vegas, the American city of the future, and it's also about su suicide, and it's also about one particular Las Vegas suicide. Uh, he then collaborated, or at least published soon after, um, uh, a book with, uh, in collaboration with his proofreader. Um, I think your magazine proofreader, yes, was it? Um, uh, it's a book in dialogic form called The Lifespan of the Fact. <coughs> it's a book that thinks about, you know, the thorny issues of nonfiction and, and what happens when you create and how that consorts with facts, such as they are. Um, and that came out in 2012. All during this time, in our new century, um, he had begun shaping, though, this is a, a long project, uh, a new history of the essay that's come out in three volumes over the past 13 years. It's a monumental achievement of selection and also a monumental achievement of introduction because every selection is preceded by a brief and unusual essay or prose poem or sentence which taken collectively are nothing less than the formulation of an, evol of, of an evolving poetics of the essay. Formulation is too head on a word though. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be too much to say that each volume can be viewed as a book length essay punctuated by sometimes very and sometimes not so very quotations. Uh, that is, each volume, as it accumulates, is a rich piece of thinking and exploration. In the spirit of the most recent volume, The Making of the American Essay, um, in, in order to spread some contagion about John's ideas about the essay's poetics and also how he goes about embodying those ideas through his own dazzling instances, I'm going to read a few brief excerpts <coughs> from The Making of the American Essay. Uh, to let them sketch in pointillistically the poetics, that is to say, I'm just going to let the poetics appear in his own words, and in the words of some of the people he quotes. Uh, and then I'm going to read one of the intros that embodies the whole shebang. And all of this I'm going to do as a way of infecting you, I hope. So here are just quotes from here from page 220. Wonder writes Emily Dickinson, is not precisely knowing and not precisely knowing not. From page 499, this is John Cage. All I know about method is that when I am not working, I sometimes think I know something. But when I am working, it's quite clear that I know nothing. And from page 269, the maritime measurement Mark Twain, which is a depth of 12 feet, is the point at which dangerously shallow <coughs> water becomes safe for river boats. But it's also the point at which safe water can suddenly turn <coughs> dangerous. From page 583, art is here to prove and to help one bear the fact that all safety is an illusion. And that's a quote from James Baldwin. And here's a quote I take to be from John. It's on page 253. And in his introduction to a W.E.B. Du Bois essay. So, let's lay it out. I believe the goal of art is to break us all open, to make us raw, to destabilize our understanding of ourselves and of the world so that we might experience both anew with fresh eyes and with the possibility of rec recognizing something that we had not recognized before. And uh, here's a kind of Zen Koan one on page 531. 
How do you forge the confluence of chance and contrivance? You gotta think about that one for a bit. It takes me a while. And another one, seeing in his own words, let me make something fabulous, fragile and flawed enough to remind us that the things that are made by human beings are as flawed as human beings. And the last one I'll read before I read this one section is on page 777, which is almost near the end of the anthology. The way I see it, if fiction means shape, and novel means new, and poetry means make, and drama means do, there ought to be a space that's reserved for our unknowing, that gorgeous, messy practice of perpetual pursuit, the attempts that are as much about apprenticeships with knowing as they are with failure to. And I would take that to be a kind of an approach to the poetics of how, how to write and how the ways in which you have to be open to writing. And here's an example of how that thing, that process, works, maybe, maybe in this instance. So here we are on page 501. We're in 1955. We're in the 50s. We're in the post-World War II era. And this little piece is a little bit about America in the 50s, and it's a little bit about <coughs> rhetoric as well. Uh, I'll put my glasses on for this one. Okay. Rhetoricians would probably call at least some of these introductions hypotactic <coughs> instruction. From the Greek words hypo, under, and tassein, to arrange. It's a style that suggests that each clause in a sentence or every point in a paragraph is the logical corollary to what comes before it. The style connotes control, in other words, confidently explaining to readers that the meanings they're being led toward are genuinely there to find. This statement is followed by this statement, which then brings me to this statement, which uh, therefore, leads me to the inevitable conclusion that 1950s America was itself hypotactic. For example, for the past decade, the U.S. government has been explaining to Americans not only that the atom bomb brought a peaceful conclusion to World War II, but that it will also improve our lives for decades to come. The U.S. State Department has banned newspapers and magazines from publishing photographs of the people who were disfigured by atomic bombs in Japan while simultaneously promoting initiatives like Project Plowshare, an experiment to clear with nuclear bombs whole parcels of land for farming, or Atomium, a playground sculpture in the shape of a giant atom that teaches children at this year's World's Fair that nuclear energy is fun, and the Nucleon, a new car funded by the Department of Energy that Ford plans to equip with its own nuclear reactor. But the most powerful display of rhetoric deployed in the service of controlling the uncontrollable will come this year on This Is Your Life, a television show that will invite two women from Hiroshima <coughs> to meet the American co-pilot who dropped the bomb on their city. They are still young, in their 20s, but because the bomb has melted their hands into claws and their necks into their shoulders and rearranged their faces just a little too much, they are shown in silhouette behind a screen on the stage. The pilot, Robert Lewis, walks out, makes a statement, shakes the hand of the man who has escorted the girls from Japan then gives the man a donation of $50 for the girls. He is nervous, a little drunk, maybe scripted, and very cold. But whatever his demeanor, the chutzpah of his presence 
on the television that night makes a bold and brutal statement about America's new dominance over everyone, everywhere. Quote, easily the most dramatic and affecting entertainment of the week, Time Magazine declares. What we do not see that night on This Is Your Life, however, is the journal Lewis kept while co-piloting the Enola Gay. The journal he auctioned off for $40,000 and in which he recorded observations from his flight on the morning of August 6th, 1945. They are observations that appear to be unrelated on the page. His notes about the clouds, temperature, time, speed, his view of the city from 30,000 feet, and then his view of smoke rings expanding out of rubble, notes that rhetoricians would call paratactic, which comes from the Greek word para, or beside, because it denotes a style of writing that levels everything in it equally, refuses to assign significance, and refuses responsibility. In this piece, this is how I am. In this piece, you can feel the shape of thinking, the startlements of juxtaposed historical fact and the kaleidoscope of details. You can feel the force of condensed storytelling as the cultural picture slows into a sustained focus on Robert Lewis, the co-pilot of the Enola Gay, and the equally painful and bizarre details of his life. And then there is return, there's a return to the subject of sentence structure and the difference between the kinds of sentences that assert logic and sense and fact, which are emblematic of the effort of controlling the uncontrollable, hypotaxis. And the other kind of sentence, parataxis, which levels all things and refuses to assign meaning and which is a moral failing. And there we are, implicated ourselves language users, users necessarily of hypotaxis and parataxis. We're required, therefore, to ask ourselves where we stand in this. Our bind and the tragedy of that historical moment all accomplished in a mere two pages. Astonishing. So please help me welcome John Gada. Um, thank you for <coughs> coming. Thank you for choosing to spend some of the evening. Uh, those of you who came on your own, and those of you who were forced to. <laughs> um, uh, I am extraordinarily honored to be here as an alum. Um, when I was a student, I went to all of the readings that um, were offered. Uh, back then, they were held in the Geneva room in, uh, in the library. And I remember sitting in that auditorium watching writers like David Foster Wallace and Rita Dove and Seamus Haney and Jory Graham and Wayne Kestenbaum. And I remember thinking to myself, I'll know I'll really have made it when I'm up on that stage. <laughs> and so, 20 years later, I know I apparently have a long way to go because we're in Hershon. <laughs> I don't know what the college is just trying to tell me. You're not all that, Degata. Um, no, I'm very, very honored to be here. Um, and so, thank you again for, for coming. Thank you. Uh, to the heat for uh, staying in the room and doing what it's doing. Um, I'm going to read uh, from an older book uh, and then maybe something new if there's time. It feels like we've kind of been here for a while already, so it, no, I just don't I don't I don't have a gauge of uh, 
your tolerance. So we'll see how this older thing goes first. Um, I notice that I think the book is being taught here, so I figured, uh, why not? Um, it's a book that came out uh, a while ago, in 2010. It's called About a Mountain. And I should, I should set up what I'm going to read, because I'm going to read from the end of it. Um, the book has two stories running through it. <coughs> One of the stories is the story of a place called Yucca Mountain in Nevada, about 90 miles north of Las Vegas. And what makes Yucca Mountain interesting is that for many years, for decades, the federal government was studying Yucca Mountain to be the place where we were going to send all of America's nuclear waste uh, for safe storage. Meaning all of the waste that we accumulate and have accumulated for decades at individual power plants around the country, about 280, I think, power plants. The idea is that we would gather all that waste, we would truck it from those power plants across the United States, bring it to Yucca Mountain, which itself would have been carved out with a series of caves. And then we would take all that waste, millions of tons of it, and you know just kind of <coughs> cram it in there. Um, and then seal the mountain shut. And in the, in the words of the Department of Energy, which is the federal agency in charge of overseeing Yucca Mountain, the mountain would then be returned to its, quote, pristine natural state. Obviously, however, with several million tons of nuclear waste inside it, it would take some time for the mountain to return to its natural, pristine state. The average half-life of the kind of waste that would end up in Yucca Mountain is roughly a million years. <laughs> that, the federal government decided, was a little too long for them to plan for, so they decided that they would plan for 10,000 years. They decided, if we can keep this stuff safe and secure for 10,000 years, we've done our job. So, um, not only did they have to figure out how to keep the mountain secure, they also had to figure out a way to alert people in the future that they should stay away from the mountain, that they shouldn't you know, bomb it or drink stuff coming out of it or build a housing development on it. But the, I think, admirable thing about how the federal government, government was thinking about Yaka is that they implicitly acknowledge that in 10,000 years, it's unlikely that the US government will still exist. <laughs> Meaning, you know, they, they couldn't just put a guard out in front of Yucca Mountain and say, stop, don't come any closer for 10,000 years. So they, they needed to develop what they called a passive warning system. Something that could um, warn people in the future without any other human intervention that Yucca was dangerous. They needed, in other words, to build a sign of some sort. A sign that could remain you know, physically intact for 10,000 years, but also whose message, whose warning, could remain coherent for 10,000 years. And it's not as simple as just um, you know, putting a billboard on top of the mountain and writing keep out on top of it. Because what language are you going to write keep out in? We don't have languages that have lasted for 10,000 years. Years. So it needed to be not in a language. It needed to nevertheless speak for itself. And so in order to get around or, or to solve this problem, the federal government formed a committee. They called this committee the Expert Judgment Panel. And it was a group of really amazing individuals. There was uh, a geologist on the board, an anthropologist, an astronomer, a graphic designer, a science fiction writer, a, an amazing array of, of people um, who all came together to try to design this marker 
that would sand a Yucca Mountain for 10,000 years. So we'll hear about some of their designs and what I'll read, and we'll also hear about what the government decided to ultimately go with. The other story in the book is a parallel story um, in some ways. It's the story of a boy in Las Vegas named Levi Presley, who um, died by committing suicide, jumping off of the tallest building in Vegas, which happens to be the, the tallest building in the uh, US west of the Mississippi. When I was in Vegas researching Yucca Mountain and living with my mom, because proudly my mom lives in Vegas, um, uh, she uh, suggested that I volunteer for the suicide hotline in Vegas, which is a, a, sounds weird, but it's something that she had done for a long time and thought I might appreciate it. So I went through their training, and on my very first night on the hotline, <coughs> excuse me, I got a call from a very young sounding person who didn't really say very much and who ultimately hung up. But later that night, watching the news with my mom, I saw a television report about a young man who had killed himself by jumping off of the top of the Stratosphere Hotel. And possessing the kind of <coughs> messed upness that I possess, I immediately convinced myself that I had spoken to that kid, that he's who I had talked to on the phone, and he is who I wasn't able to help. And so all while I was in Vegas researching Yucca, I was secretly researching this boy, Levi Presley, trying to figure out who he was and um, whether I had actually talked to him, whether I had had anything to do with his death. So we'll hear a little bit about his story, too. Um, and we'll see how far we get. In 10,000 years, Vega, not Polaris, will be our North Star. The space satellite Voyager, which was launched in 1979 and which has since been traveling 40,000 miles per hour will be closer to the absolute emptiness of space than it will be to our home. Even the Earth's continents, which have been migrating slowly since they initially were formed, will be 850 feet farther apart. There will also be a new axial tilt in our planet. It will temporarily shift us away from the sun, lowering global temperatures by as much as 50 degrees. Around Yucca Mountain at that time, there will be a grassy plain. Most of Russia won't be inhabitable. Maybe Iran will be a ski resort. A new volcanic island will appear beside Hawaii. Plastic will be extinct because petroleum will be too. And while we won't be living longer than we currently are living, Frank Tipler's book, The Physics of Immortality, says that if we're wealthy, we'll be able to buy the brains of younger body donors, download our memories into their minds, and then live through them vicariously until we need another donor. We will be living underground or we will be living in giant domes, or we will be living in a single network city that sprawls across the planet called Ecumenopolis. Physicist John Fremlin believes, in fact, that the human population by the year 12,000 will be 61 trillion strong. Our food will have to be harvested from algae and cadavers and pumped into our homes as daily liquid rations. Rodney Brooks, the director of MIT's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, believes, however, that humans are going to have such exquisite control over the genetics of living systems that instead of growing a tree, cutting it down, and then <coughs> building a table from it, we ultimately will be able to just grow a table from scratch. 
Yet as Warwick Collins explains in his book Computer One, most of the work on the planet by the late 21st century will be conducted by a giant global supercomputer that will relegate humans to the role of pampered pets. It will control the water supply, the food supply, electricity, transportation. It will be programmed to repair itself and to, and to anticipate situations that might necessitate more repairs. And this is the reason why, 500 years after we invest in building it, Computer One will calculate the chances that human beings might interfere with the work it's programmed to do. It will reason that interferences are a threat to its efficiency, and it will logically conclude that it could raise its productivity if humans were not around. It will be quiet on the earth. It will be a lot of wind. From the ridgeline of Yucca Mountain, we might look down at something called Black Hole, one of the designs for a warning marker from the expert judgment panel. 90,000 square feet of black basalt stone irregularly carved and cobbled onto the sandy ground. A crazy quilt of parched land, the panel describes it as. Cracked, hard to lock on, projecting the image of nothing, a void, uselessness, a place that would seem unwelcoming and uninhabitable because the region will absorb so much heat through these stones that an intruder will simply not be able to stand being there. Or we might stand on Yucca Mountain and listen to the moans, an echoing oral effect from a series of stone sculptures that would be carved to emit a single pitch in the wind. A minor D, writes the panel, because that note usually signals to our brains that it is sad. Or we may see forbidden blocks, or we may see rubble landscape, we may see irregular grid, spikes in a field, landscape of thorns, tall leaning stones, we may see a whole catalog of visceral warning markers. Artificially built environments will be meant to enter into to help make their warnings work. But these will be environments, writes the panel in its report, that will exist without transmitting any gestalt for the intruder, without perceivable foci, without the possibility of being understood. Why? We must find ourselves, the panel says, having an experience, an assaying into the purpose of what's apparently purposeless, an assaying that tries desperately to cull significance from the place, but an assaying, says the panel, that must ultimately fail. Quote, all human cultures, writes the panel in its report, have tried marking spaces that they have wanted to call the center. It is an impulse to create order out of the chaos that surrounds us, the tribal fire, the village temple, the city's clock tower. But this is why we must invert the symbolic logic of this site, establish a sense of meaninglessness around the entire mountain, suggest that there is no single place of value at the site that the land itself is shunned, devastated by the earth. But what we are likely to see instead, according to recent reports from the Department of Energy, is a small series of 20-foot high monuments at the site. They'll be carved in the shape of pyramids and made from local granite. On their surfaces will be inscriptions in English about the site, plus the date the waste was buried, the date it will be safe, and a small engraved image in the apex of each stone that reproduces the anguished face from Edvard Munch's The Scream. Quote, it's the most recognizable painting in the world, said a Department of Energy <laughs> spokesman when I called to ask about it. Human culture will probably change dramatically over the next 10,000 years, but human emotions won't. So anyone who comes in contact with this space over the next 10 millennia is going to understand what's up with this site. <laughs> that there's something about it that's dangerous, scary, and likely to make them sick. 
I like the idea of a design that just gives the viewer a mood, but we're dealing with life and death here. The most responsible thing we can do in this case is give easily interpretable information. We're trying to help these people. End quote. What we probably know is that he left his house by 5 o'clock, down the block on Pildra Street, around the corner to the tram, or down the block on Pildra Street by foot to Carl Johan. He would have passed the place that's now a bar called Edward's Bar and Grill, and then the all day slices shop called Edward's Oven Fresh, and then a store across the street called Scream If You Like Sweets. He could have cut through grazing place, where every citizen could keep cattle, and then walk across a bridge that linked the city to its shore. But Edward says he liked to walk. I need to walk to think. And he knew a longer path up Eckerberg Hill and through its forest. This was 1883, and it was very likely August. Up the hill, as Edward walked, he passed couples stretched on blankets, dozens of slanting bodies on the city's lover's lane. Then he reached the forest once the meadow hillside leveled, and then he walked inside the woods, despite his father's warnings. <coughs> there is evil there, his father said, long forgotten curses from Norway's pagan past. Edward turned 19 that year and was living still at home. He would have needed his dad's permission to have been out past 6.30. He would have needed to miss his dinner, retired early to his room, established two days earlier that he was feeling kind of ill. He would have needed three years earlier to have had rheumatic fever, and needed 12 years earlier to almost die on Christmas Day. And then he would have needed a low window he could climb through. There was a gray straw hat he wore every single day that I knew him from the time that he was 15 until he left home for Berlin, according to a memoir by Edward's closest friend. He would have needed that straw hat, some good walking shoes, the light wool brown coat that all middle class boys wore. He would have needed 40 minutes to pass through Eckberg's forest and would have needed to understand its ancient pagan history the 3,000-year-old practice of bringing infants here to die, digging narrow graves over which boulders were then laid so that the child didn't suffocate, but rather starved to death, a practice that was so common by the early 11th century that St. Olaf, the Christian bishop who arrived to baptize pagans, wrote a letter to Norwegians enforcing three new Christian laws. Number one, there shall be no more folk singing in God's northern kingdom, for these are not the sounds our Lord and Savior wants to hear. Two, there shall desist immediately all the eating of horse meat. And number three, because all Christian lives begin with holy baptism, no longer may, may any child be left exposed if it's unwanted the last of which proved so controversial for the pagans of Norway that one decade later, in the famous Gula Things Law, a revision was applied in which, quote, no healthy child may be exposed if it's unwanted, except if his toes are in the place of his knees, whose chin is turned around and connected to the shoulder, the neck upon his breast, the skin on his legs turning scaly in complexion, his two eyes on the sides of the poor child's head, or goat horns, a dog's tail. The child must be brought to the forest, therefore, and buried where neither men nor cattle ever go. Conditions which were apparently not uncommon at the time. For, as Jenny Jokins explains in Women in Old Norse Society, the low valley villages and the high rolls of mountains confined the majority of Norwegians to their homes, forcing upon the culture a certain amount of inbreeding, and thus resulting in increasingly deformed infants at birth. He would have needed to know the phrase, 
I christen thee at random, John or Joanna, the spell St. Olaf wrote to ward off any Utbird, the wide-eyed, pale, and hairless ghosts of Norway's exposed children, the thin, hairless, shrieking souls who haunted Ekberg's forest, looking for their parents. He would have needed to know that night if one mistook him for its father, clinging to his back with a black and gaping jaw, that the only way to rid oneself at that point of an Utberg is to convince the child to kill itself and then bury it again. But what he wouldn't have ever known during his walk there, walk there as a teen is that his childhood friend in 15 years would kill himself in Eckberg. Wouldn't have ever known once he had reached the other side, looking down the hill to the city's ancient shore, that his sister would be committed, that he would never visit her, and that eventually she would die along the city's shoreline, through the forest, down the hill, in a loud and red asylum from which the screams that were heard were so consistently high-pitched that local residents never forgot that it had been a slaughterhouse. Wouldn't have ever known that this view he now walked toward would eventually be the city's <coughs> most famous for postcards, most famous for drug arrests, most infamous for rape. Wouldn't have ever seen, as he brushed off the forest leaves, the stone marker that the city will never place upon that spot, commemorating where Edward first felt that he was hurt. Won't see the bench that's there, the one turned the wrong direction. Would it need to cross the highway where there is no crossing walk, approaching the metal guardrail which no longer is a railing? Would it need to glimpse below to where the tracks are running now, to the forward service road, the power grid, the industry of concrete ports and forklift trucks and corrugated terminals for Unical and Exxon and BP and Shell. Didn't have to reach the bottom of that hill among the rocks. Didn't need his parents dead, favorite sister, younger brother, older sister, to be dead, to help bleach their bloodied sheets to light brown mottled spots with urine. Didn't need to hate his father, love with fear his smiling mother, never needed to kiss a boy before he'd ever kissed a girl, and then to go on living without anyone to kiss. Didn't need those critics saying that he'd invent something brand new, that he would feel an ancient emptiness at the center of the world and then gather up that emptiness into something that had borders, a face, the chance to see what's wrong. Never needed someone saying that God is not in every detail, that God is sometimes in experience. Someone to write letters to, from whom he could get letters back, take train trips with, and snuggle with, and then never to have met. He didn't need the earth, 10 million years ago, to rumble from the bottom of its ocean floor a mountain, a 4,000-acre island in Indonesia called Rakata, one of 13,000 islands in the narrow Sunda Strait on which the fabled Krakatoa, a mountain on the mountain, a volcano whose eruption in 1400 BCE is said to have caused tsunamis that were so big they sank Atlantis, a volcano whose eruption in 537 is said to have clouded skies so thoroughly that summer that it snowed in Rome in June, that crops in Europe failed, that floods appeared in deserts, that wandering Mongolians retreating from the weather fled with tribal families west into Eurasia, ended the Persian Empire, and started modern Islam. A volcano that locals called the pulsing heart of all the world never needed to erupt with so much power once again that on August 25th, the week preceding Edward's walk, it practiced an eruption at 5.30 in the evening, then practiced at 6.40, then 8.21, then 10, 10.50, midnight, and 1, and then finally at 3.30 on August 26th, 
It erupted with a force that raised 160 villages, killed 40,000 people, burst so loudly that radiometrists have called the mountain's blast the second loudest noise ever heard by human beings, sending out concussive waves seven times around the world and exploding up a mile high and then exploding out blanketing the atmosphere with 227 million tons of new debris, over two-thirds of the island's entire rocky mass, dust that drifted across the earth so thoroughly and fast that by August 28th, British offices in Delhi were reporting having seen a bank of yellow clouds at night. By August 29th, they were orange in Madrid and by August 31st, they mixed with moisture over London, where a cold front pushed the dust and rain westward over Norway, where the nights were very windy, and where light revealed that dust as red in skies that bled already. His name was Levi Cressley, the Vegas paper said. 16 years old and from the north edge of town. I tried to call his parents, but their number wasn't listed. I tried to go to his funeral, but his service was in public. I even called an ad that I had found in the yellow pages, Venus Investigations, a private investigation firm for sensitive local cases. Venus had a, a smoker's voice, a barking dog and screaming kids in jeopardy <coughs> in the background. $400 cash, she said for any vital information. I sent the money wired. Five days later, Venus called and said, there's a tape. A tape, I asked? A security tape. Every incident in a hotel in the city of Las Vegas is recorded by thousands of cameras that are embedded in the ceilings. So if someone's cheating at cards, Venus said over the phone, or if there's a fight somewhere, or murder, or any kind of shit, the hotel can edit together all the relevant footage and send it to the Vegas police. It limits their liability. And they made one of these of Levi, I asked. That's what I'm hearing, man, now. I wonder if I could see it. Now why the fuck would you want that? <laughs> Levi liked going to Applebee's, in and out and a place that's now out of business. He wore a lot of white, sometimes a silver chain, and purple tinted glasses. He liked a girl named Mary, also Eminem. Was called by his mom, my little boomer. His Chrysler the Baron was Goose. He said that he was sad. I asked about what. He said some stuff. I asked like what. Doesn't matter. Why not? Just sucks. Hung up. I sat beside the Presleys on a green leather Lazy Boy sectional recliner with the ceramic black urn of Levi's ashes in my lap. We were beneath their cathedral ceiling. We were watching TV land. We had nuts and we had triscuits and we had spinach dip and coke. We ate soup and then a salad and then chicken and then brownies. We looked for several minutes at his art in their new den. We drove across the valley to Taekwondo for kids, the studio Levi practiced at and coached others after school. We sat in his coach's office among piles of trophy pieces. We helped screw the golden kickers into braided sequined pillars and then dark wooden bases that read achievement on their plaques. We learned that Taekwondo only has nine levels. There is white, yellow, orange, green, blue, purple, red, and brown, and then a whole series of advanced black belts, each with its own complexity of reticulated levels, nine tiers of nine grades in nine stages without end. Because Korean culture does not believe we can be perfect. We agreed this was significant because he fell for nine seconds. I also learned that God resides in the ninth order of heaven. That before he could receive the secret meaning of runes, 
Odin had to hang for nine days on a tree. There are always nine muses alive at any time, always nine maidens in ancient Celtic myths, always nine floors in sacred Buddhist temples. If a servant finds nine peas in a pod and places that pod on the floor of her kitchen, the first man who comes in and tramples that pod will be the man she marries. Possession, they say, is nine-tenths of the law. Nine people, says the Bible, will be stoned on Judgment Day. Thrice to thine and thrice to mine and thrice again to make up nine is how Shakespeare's three witches guaranteed Macbeth's charm. For nine, said Pythagoras, is that which brings completion. <coughs> I think we knew, however, that he really fell for eight. Drove back to where they lived, made plans for dinner soon, kissed and hugged and waved goodbye and said we'd be in touch. I left Las Vegas five months after Mom and I arrived. At some point it came clear while I was visiting the Presleys that in fact I had not spoken to their son the night he died. It was clear as I left Vegas that some other boy had called. Clear that if I point to something seeming like significance, there is the possibility that nothing real is there. Sometimes we misplace knowledge in pursuit of information. Sometimes our wisdom too in pursuit of what's called knowledge. What do you think? When it calls for a transition? Yeah, between like the two marriages. Well, you know, in this, I don't know if, it, if you could hear it, but you probably couldn't hear it because I was pausing. But um, one thing I try to do in the book is not provide any transitions between the two stories, um, or even any of the stories, right? There's no, there's kind of, I, I can always tell when I'm reading that, when we reach the Edward Monk section, that people are like, what the fuck is now going on? Until we realize it's Edward Monk and then people calm down. But I, I, I wanted, given the, some of the themes that I think the book is working with, I, I, I didn't want to announce transitions. I wanted things to, to flow into one another and to sometimes feel, at least temporarily, a little, um, uh, or for us to feel a little destabilized. Um, I also just, for my own sake, wanted to experiment with the transitionless transition, if that makes sense. So there are no breaks in the book. Um, I mean, there are paragraph breaks and everything, but there aren't any section breaks. A very early, <coughs> because we are in school, I'll share this with you, though it's embarrassing, a really early draft of the book, um, uh, was still working with the number nine because I was kind of obsessed with it at the time. Uh, so it had nine sections. It was I think like 500 pages as opposed to 200 pages and only nine paragraphs. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I thought, oh, no transitions, let's really go for it. But it was unreadable. Um, so I can't really answer your question because I, I wasn't paying attention to the transition. <laughs> now you're going to. Yes? Who did you dedicate your book to? Uh, it's dedicated to whoever that boy was who called, and who I you know, lost track of because he clearly wasn't Levi. <laughs> 
So the last section is one paragraph. Uh, yeah, it is. That's a remnant of the earlier. It's the only thing that survived. Why? Why? <laughs> why did it survive, or why is it no, one no, paragraph? Why, like, because it seems as though the last section does something different than any other part of the book. And I'm wondering if you chose to keep the one paragraph uh, because of that. Well, the, so the last section of the book follows what I read you. There's just one more section, and it is a section that is explicitly about Levi's death. And the only way I knew how to handle it was to um, track Levi's walk through that hotel and casino, his way up the tower of the hotel and then, and then down off its edge. Actually, it starts at his home, in his bedroom, leaving. And um, uh, um, So there aren't any breaks for a number of reasons. There's very little of me in that section. It, it attempts to be as, um, not necessarily objective, but as um, observational or as observant as possible. Um, and so I didn't want to interrupt it with any of my nonsense. Um, but also, uh, it's all one paragraph, and it's, I don't know, five or seven pages. I partially wanted, you know, as Levi makes his way through the hotel and the casino and then a mall, they're all attached in this one horrible complex. Um, he's passing a lot of just absurd and, you know, difficult, I mean, there's, you know, troubling things. If you're just alive in America, I think we would feel troubled. Um, and on top of that, we know you know, we know in the very first section of the book that Levi's going to die. So when he gets to the hotel early on in that section, we know he's on his way to his death. So on top of the awfulness that's crowding in on us, um, there's his death that we know is coming. And then I just sort of wanted to formally add to it the sense that we can't get out of this paragraph until the paragraph ends. That there's, you know, there's no break for us. That's all. Yes? At any point in your process, did you receive like, a lot of uh, backlash for focusing so much on the, the, the book on a, a suicide of a young boy that you never met? Um, he's actually a small portion of the book, but um, I got to know his parents, and um, they were uh, very enthusiastic. Uh, in fact, there were times when I actually was going to give up on the project, and they really wanted it to go forward. Um, there's actually a film that's being made about this, and they are, they're in the film. I'm not even in the film, but <laughs> they're in it. They're, you know, they're very into um, telling his story, and uh, they've become, at least his mom has become, um, though she has moved out of Vegas, she's become a, um, an advocate for education about teen suicide in Vegas, because it's a bit of an epidemic. Um, um, and their approval was the only thing I worried about. It's the only thing I could worry about. Um, there, there are always, you all are growing up as writers and just as people in a, in a world that has given itself license to comment on, on everything that you do in your lives. Um, and so it's, I think, important to learn how to figure out what feedback matters and what feedback is just bullshit. And for me, I, I set the line at his parents. If they're OK with this, then, then we're going forward. And they did. They set some ground rules, certainly. There are things I haven't written about. There are things I've learned that aren't in the book. Um, but that's all. I could worry about, because otherwise you you can just tangle yourself up in, in self-doubt. Um, yeah. I'm interested, what was your relationship with the form of the essay like when you were a student at the colleges, and how has it evolved? Um, you know, 
the colleges are weird. This is a weird place. <laughs> um, I was never, you know, I lucked out in that I was working uh, with a professor named Deborah Tall, who was an amazing poet and also became an amazing nonfiction writer. And I got here just in time so that, you know, she was really into exploring the intersections of the two genres. Traditions of the essay began. We were, you know, just really into exploring what could be done. And now you've got just as amazing people. I'm teaching an essay class now, and the, if they're here, they can tell you that often I'm the most conservative person in the room, um, encouraging them to, uh, you know, not break as many lines and let's, <laughs> let's try to make it to the end of the page. And, uh, just to see if we can do it. Um, so uh, I, so I, I never, as a student, and I doubt you, as students, are are encountering much kickback. But this is a bit of a bubble in terms of the essay world. Um, the larger essay community is not quite at a place yet where it is comfortable with acknowledging that the essay should do anything other than announce its argument up front and, and follow through with trying to prove that argument and then announcing, I just proved my argument, and then, um, and then <laughs> leaving it there. Uh, and I don't really know why a lot of it has to do with the fact that I think the essay isn't, isn't taught as much beside poetry and fiction as a literary form, and so we're just not used to talking about it as literature and therefore not used to reading it as literature and allowing it to be literature, allowing it to do some of the things that poetry and fiction and drama um, do. We don't have a tradition in the US or anywhere, it seems, of um, a tradition of criticism of the essay, right? In, in, in the way that poetry has 3,000 years of people not just writing poetry, but writing about poetry. And fiction, not as long, but as long as there has been fiction, there have been people writing about fiction. The essay, not so much, because it has often been the thing that writers do in between their fiction projects or in between their poetry <laughs> projects. Um, and it hasn't quite been taken as seriously. Um, so uh, this is not what you asked, but the answer is I didn't get much kickback. But when you leave this world and enter the other one, you may receive some kickback if you do something funky with your essay. And I don't know what to tell you about that other than uh, you know just roll over and play dead or fight back. <laughs> And um, you know, talk about some essays that you love that do unusual things yet still are essays, so that gradually, several generations from now, people will take it for granted that essays can do literary things. Yes. Yes. Um, why did you choose to read that chapter of your book? <laughs> um, it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> um, do you know the book? Are there better ones? <laughs> uh, um, you know, there's a lot of, it moves around a lot, and that is, I think, maybe fun to listen to, or at least it's amusing to read. Um, and I was going to read uh, the entire end, including the part about Levi's death, but didn't. And so it just felt like oh, the conclusion is kind of self-contained, so that makes sense. I don't really have a good answer for that. <laughs> um, kind of going along with how you use the transition to have um, like unsteadiness, did you also, because there's a lot of repetitive forms in your like sentence structures, did you intentionally do that to emphasize what you were talking about, or did you do repetitiveness and then like take it away just to also cause unsteadiness? 
take away what? Like, like you, you would have like repetitive kind of sentences and then you would stop doing that and go into maybe like a paragraph form or something. Or did you do that for emphasis or did you do it to um, kind of cause the unsteadiness that you did with the transitions? Uh huh. Um, if I'm interpreting uh, what you mean by repetitiveness um, the same way, there are uh, there are moments of um, syntax that are identical in sentences, uh, certainly. And yeah, that is for emphasis. There, it's a it's a way. You know, I gave myself, as I said earlier, the word that I wasn't going to break the text or do pauses or sections or anything like that. So I paragraph the hell out of the thing. I mean, there, there are a lot of paragraph breaks. And sometimes there are paragraphs that are just a line at a time. And that can give you, that can signal to the reader of, um, that the rhythm has changed. And if you do that a few times in a row, you get that repetitive notion. And then it signals something entirely different if then you launch into a much longer paragraph. So um, your question, though, is, uh, I forget the rest of it. Is that enough, though? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes? Um, so I wanted to know a little bit about your journey. You talk a lot about how um, trying to figure out why they chose the 10,000 year date in your book, and how you jump from department to department and person to person. So the, the question is about a moment in the book when uh, I realized that even though the half-life of this waste headed for Yucca Mountain is about a million years, why they why the government decided on ten thousand? And I, you know, call my contact at the Department of Energy, and they don't know, and they send me to someone else, and I forget. You probably know better how many different offices I'm sent to. And the question is, why did you keep up with that? It seems very frustrating. And yeah, it was. But the moment it started happening, the moment it was clear that no one had any clue why ten thousand years was selected. I knew that that was a story that I wanted to talk to. His, I was almost begging them, you know, to send me to another office because I was just <laughs> hiding the slapstickiness that the government has just no clue what's going on. Um, so, you know, that's less. There are far more frustrating research uh, moments in researching. That's a gift, and that's just. Keep, keep going, fellows, because this is just gold. But, you know, there are other moments when, you know, there are quotes you just can't find the sources for, or, um, you know, people are contradicting each other, and it's not something that you actually want to make light of. It's actually a, a matter you kind of have to find the answer for, and that can get frustrating. But that was a fun Thank you. Thank you.